Hi everyone, Rhiannon with uh, the Bering County Circle Association here today. And it is another edition of Tell It To Me Thursdays. And I will be very honest in this age of COVID-19, sometimes events like this mean that I stay on task a little bit more and know exactly what day it is. <laughs> Um, as usual, I'm coming to you from the sheriff's house or residence or office or the multiple names that it has here on the campus of the History Center Courthouse Square. We are in our third week of doing this series, and last week we talked about collections. Those are the physical objects that are in our, um, in our vaults downstairs. These are your textiles, your dishes, your jewelry, your guns, your... Uh, farming implements, all the physical objects of our organization. And this week we wanted to talk about archives. Now I know in a lot of places you'll hear collections and that is overarching for everything that they have within their um, vaults. That's paper as well as physical. Some places are collections and archives um, and sometimes they are two completely separate and, and much larger institutions are completely separate categories. They're completely separate um, departments. So I know when I worked at Minnetrissa Cultural Center as a volunteer and intern, I worked under collections. That meant that I, when I volunteered, I worked specifically with the physical collections. If I needed something like a photo, when I moved on to, for example, when I moved on to the internship portion of my time there and I needed to pull photos, I went to the archivist. The work of a collections manager and archivist are very similar and do a lot of very similar work. Um, they follow the same protocols, they follow the same patterns, they follow the same policies that are, um, hi, Gay, thanks for coming to us from St. Joe. We're very excited to have you. Um, so anyway, so I was saying, uh, we, uh, we follow very similar patterns, but the process of obviously preserving collections is dependent on the type of object it is. The same thing occurs with archives. So we have multiple different types of archives here at the museum. Again, all of this has been donated to us. As far as I know, none of this was actually purchased back in the day. Um, it's not uncommon for an institution to have the funds to, per to purchase items, but we choose not to do that. We, per we just kind of, we're at the whim of everyone who donates to us. Um, so we're gonna look at a couple of different things today. And like last week, we'll talk about some processes that we use that you can use at home for modified purposes. Now, last week I mentioned, I used the phrase Hollingsworth. Hollingsworth is not the company I was thinking of, it was Hollings Metal Edge. And unfortunately, I do not have um, any of their stuff with me today, but I do have stuff from Gaylord. So the two companies that we use are Gaylord and Hollings Metal Edge. Now, I would like to make this very clear. And I don't think I made it clear last week, but I want to do clarify it today. When you're looking at stuff in places like Michael's or other sources or even on Amazon where it says acid free, that's better than stuff that does have acid in it. It's a little bit more long term. You're looking for archival quality. Now, obviously, like super duper professional archival stuff from Gaylord is going to be expensive. You know, a, a single box can set you back $30. But if you're going to Amazon and a smaller company has got an acid free archival quality box for 15 bucks, you're fine, especially since you're probably preserving it for your own family. You're not necessarily going to be putting it in different locations. It's not going to travel a lot. It's going to kind of stay put. Um, so some of the things that we're going to talk about today are things like newspapers and photos and books and things like that. So one of the things that we do here is when we're category, when we're doing our categorization, our accessioning, everything gets assigned an accession number. That number tells us how to find things in the system. So we put in the past perfect. If I'm looking for a particular item via, via the accession number, I can type it in that way. Um, what started under Bob Myers, our very first, well, our second curator, actually, Bob Mornhart, I think is how it's pronounced, was um, Gary, was it Bob? Dave, Dave Monahan, I have it right over here. I could go look it up. Uh, he was our very first director curator way back in the 1970s. Um, Bob came a little bit later in 1985. Um, Sandra was our third one, and hopefully here in a couple weeks we'll have our fourth one. Not too bad for a 60 year old organization. So what he did is he started what we call the P code. Um, P for picture, and it's a, a number assigned to our uh, picture so we can look it up via P code. Um, so instead of assigning a number, an accession number on the front of our boxes, we have the P code. So P100 to 300 are in this box. 
Um, we use <clears throat> narrow boxes like this guy um, because that's what Bob started using. But there are versions that are short and squat. They're called postcard boxes. And the top comes off, and then you can have um, barriers put in there. So if you want to group your photos by family, friends, you know, landscapes, or whatever, you can do that. And then we use, you can use multiple different things, but we use um, guides like this. These are manila envelopes. These are not what you get at, like, um, at uh, Staples or anything. These are also from Gaylord. And in the corner, we put the P code so we can easily find it. And then inside the picture, or inside there, we have the picture. Now, it's a little hard to see because I'm a little bit backlit, and I'm trying. You would think by week three, I would have figured this out a little bit. I probably could close the thing. But in the very back, we it's very hard to see. It's very hard to see. But in this corner, we have our accession number. We also have the P code. And then this tells us what the accession number is. So if I go by this accession number in our system, it will tell me exactly where this picture is taken of. It will, um, we know the date on it because it was stamped by um, Han Photo Service Aerial Photography out of Hartford, Michigan, April 11th, 1963. Uh, my dad was three years old at the time. My mom was just shy of two. Um, this is, I don't know. I just pulled the box out. So it'll tell me who this is. It'll tell us who the donor is. Um, when we get things donated to us very much like our art, very much like the collections, we make sure that we keep an accurate record of who sends things to us, who has given it to us. Um, sometimes we have to put pictures into them twice because maybe we just don't have a lot. In that case, if you are doing something like this, you can, um, very nice, Peter. Thank you so much. So if, when you guys are watching this, please check the comments because Peter, who's been phenomenal the last two weeks we've been doing this, has linked to Holling, Holling or Metal Edge. I really wish I had some of their boxes that were in good shape. Most of them are not. Anyway, so if you have to double up your photos, if you decide you're going to put them in sleeves like this, Back to back. Here's why. Because what happens is, is if you put them front to front and there's anything on these photos that may scratch the other one, you'll end up damaging the other, the other photo. Also, the ink is on this side. This can leach if it's put in um, conditions that are not optimal. So generally the optimal area is like 55 degrees humidity in the 60 to 70 heat range. Obviously ours kind of goes back and forth. Um, based on the time of year. Um, and then we also have issues. Um, we also have issues with um, leaking windows just because of the age of the building. We're looking when we redo the collection and archives, like hopefully later this year, the goal, we got time, let's do it. Um, we would probably correct that as well. Um, usually a humidifier. Do not put paper products in a cedar chest. My mother does this. I wish she would stop. Cedar leaches acid and other um, chemicals from the natural woods that can damage your paper goods. No cedar chest. None. So anyway, back to back. This same, when you're, put, when you're storing away uh, photos um, or paintings, do the same thing. Back to back. And then if you're going to front to front them, put a thin piece of um, Paper, like acid-free tissue paper, or even um, the squishy stuff. You guys know what I'm talking about. That stuff will work as well. Um, but tissue paper is a lot better and pure white, non-dyed. So no dyes leach into your into your photos, into your paintings, whatever. Um, so this is how we, we store those. One of our bigger issues is by the time things come to us, they have been in very bad shape, um, very bad shape. This is, we actually have, I'm pretty sure it's the, I don't think it's the entirety of their historical archives, but the YWCA out of Benton Harbor, um, we have their collections. In fact, I could probably pick this up and show you. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boxes of stuff that are just the, that's just photos and scrapbooks and paper cutouts and files. We do have some physical stuff from them as well, but in terms of archives, we have like, yeah, like eight boxes of stuff. We're slowly going through it. That was donated to us several years ago. It kind of got caught up in the in uh, not long after Bob left, so it's kind of been sitting here. We have a wonderful 
uh, volunteer by the name of Vicki who's been slowly going through it. And I can tell you the pictures that we found in one of the boxes are aggressively, aggressively 90s. Guys, we made some very bad decisions. Holy cow. Anyway, so a good example is this. This is an old scrapbook. So when we're dealing with scrapbooks, a lot of times we just people just glue things in there. And if you find yourself in a position where you have stuff put in your an old scrapbook that's coming out, then what you may want to do is go to something, go, go someplace like Michael's, and this will be fine for temporary services, and find their photo, um, their photo corners. And you can put those, then you can put those back into place. Be careful with your scrapbooks because sometimes the paper is not very good. So this one is from 1958 to 1959. This is Status of Women Around the World, the AAUW Study Group. The cover is long since gone. So in this case, you are probably want to put this gently into a box, acid-free if you can get it, an acid-free box that's flat. Allow it to lay flat. Do not stick it in this way. Do not stick it in this way because you will end up damaging the edges. Additionally, as you can, you probably can't really tell too much from this angle, but we already have items that are starting to come out. Um, so we have very loose papers. By putting it flat into a box with a layer of tissue paper over it or an insert that supports this, uh, supports something else on top of it, it'll keep everything inside. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of times I have picked up something and whoosh, stuff all comes out. I just came across yesterday in my hunt or something else for our arc, uh, for our exhibit downstairs, another yet another scrapbook for the BCHA back when we were first starting everything out, and things are coming out of it, and and that what happens is and that takes it out of the narrative, and we don't know where that went. Sometimes you can see the blue shape, you kind of maybe if you're really good at puzzles, figure it out, but try to keep it that way. Um, when you're doing scrapbooking now. If you're doing scrapbooking now, thinking long-term saving of these photos, you know, and these memories, if you're gonna do it, my recommendation is if you have something that's written on the back, like on the back of a photo, put it next to it, quote it underneath. I came across a scrapbook where a gentleman had quoted years underneath these postcards that he had. Um, and we, he didn't have to do that, but that gives us an idea. It says 1909, we know that postcard is from 1909. So if we're trying to identify where in St. Joe or Benton Harbor or Niles or wherever that, that picture came from, we can simply say, well, 1909, this is what would have been and this is where it's at. It can help us narrow down if there's not more information out there. So um, <clears throat> definitely do that. Um, I actually keep scrapbooks for letters that my friends, I have a friend who lives overseas and she sends me a ton of postcards. So what I do is I do the corners. Um, Oh, I have in the past, I've done the corners. If you choose not to go with the corners, instead of do like a little, don't glue the whole thing down. Get little corner tackies um, for scrapbooking and then put them in the corners because if then that way down the road, if someone tries to cut out that postcard or that photo or that card, they can do it in the corners and do minimal damage to the overall book and to the item. But please transcribe that. So I actually sit there. That's what I do at the end of the year. I send all the postcards she sent me and goes into this, and I transcribe everything that she writes on the back so that I can read it for myself later. Plus, it'll tell us, and we can do minimal damage. So down the road, if, say, I become rich and famous and all this goes into an archive to a university or whatever, then they'd be able to read it and know the kind of communications that my friend and I had. So scrapbooks are very helpful in storing things. Look at that. thing. See? See? Look at this. It fell out. Women of Greece, radio, TV, AAU study group subjects. November 6th, 1958. So I don't know where in here this goes, so I'm going to have to put this in here, and then later on when we go through and we catalog it, we're going to try and find the original location, assuming we can get to this <laughs> in a relatively short amount of time. Newspapers are probably the hardest things to deal with because naturally the paper that newspapers are printed on are meant to deteriorate. So they will always, 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 always turn yellow. Um, it's also very, they also become very brittle. And so folding them in half means that later on down the road, even a few years down the road, it becomes so brittle that it can tear and break. 
Um, if you are keeping newspapers, layer in between each grouping of newspapers as a free tissue paper and lay them flat. I, let me see, you guys can, oh, yeah, you guys can see. So these guys are super, super, super long and wide boxes. They are around three feet by two feet. So these we would most likely use for our much larger items like atlases and plot maps or plat maps. Um, and then in terms of archive and collections, like things like clothing and like hats and shoes can be put in there. Get something big, you can get them very narrow. We have in the next room versions that are like literally like they're like this thick. They're meant for very thin objects. Um, they are very clunky and they can be very unwieldy, but they're a good option. They're a good option for um, <clears throat> good option for um, laying papers flat. Try to do them as flat as you can. And again, the acid free will help draw out any of those uh, dyes and things that normally happen to newspapers. Um, if you're going to cut out an article, again, follow, like I said before, with the corner so you don't damage it. Um, because clearly, as, it's, as I've shown you already, that sometimes that paper glue does not stay and things fall out. Um, one of the things that we do have a lot of that we have both good examples and bad examples are of um, photo albums. Plastic, photo albums. Plastic is not our friend, ladies and gentlemen. If you're looking for storage for your items, go metal. Metal is always going to be your best bet. Wood is the worst, plastic is a little bit better, but the metal is your best bet because both plastic and metal give off um, fumes and they can also do some serious, especially wood because it does deteriorate and that deterioration can leach into your other stuff. So we have this very wonderful, um, very wonderful, uh, <clears throat> it's not a scrapbook, so, so to speak, but it is certainly, um, it's a, photo album and it's got things in here like birth certificates, and, well not birth certificates, I'm sorry, baptismal certificates. We have um, high school letter. This is all in plastic. One of the worst things you can do is use these old, these much newer uh, division picture guys. Because what happens is if that thing, the, the plastic is put in any sort of high heat situation, it can seal the plastic and damage the photo. We actually have three, as far as I know. I've only found three, but we're still finding things around here. Uh, we have three books like this where we can't get the picture out of the sleeve to put it into one of these boxes that would be like such and such collection. You know, this will be a singular collection. It'll all have things in, in one box or whatever. There is no way for us to get them out. It's completely sealed. And not only that, the plastic has adhered to the photo. If we were trying to pull that apart, we would literally severely damage beyond any restoration that photo. So there are conservators out there who can fix that. They are not cheap. And here's the thing. You know, when it comes to conservation, you do not want to go cheap. You are paying for someone's knowledge to save your memories. So if you come across an old school binder like this with photos and things in it and it's been damaged go on google look up conservators and start searching around the cool thing is we are close to the university of notre dame we're also close to the city of chicago so in comparison to others and even to some degree indianapolis where there will be opportunities where you can find conservators to do it some of them work in museums some work as independent conservators so you'll just need to find someone who can work explicitly with it and always always, always ask to see copies of their work. Someone who cannot provide you copies of their work are not necessarily untrustworthy, but if you can't see the befores and afters to confirm that they are what they say they can do is what they can do, you're playing a little bit of a roulette there and the Russians would not necessarily be pleased with it. So when you're storing things in this, find, if you choose to do something like this, I do know Michaels has acid-free versions, always go with acid-free versions first. Then make sure this guy is stored in good temperatures. Again, back to that 50 to 70 range with 55% humidity. If something becomes damaged via water, 
go see a conservator as well. Um, sometimes you might be, if they're independent, like they're, they're not stuck in something, you can just pull the picture out. Uh, there are some people out there who could do um, Photoshop restoration, and you can at least scan it in and get a, a restored version via a digital restored version. But um, sometimes things happen. If you're looking, the other reason why I recommend storing in metal is because if your house ever catches on fire, and I have been through this, so yes, it can happen, you'll want to store things, all of your valuable documents, in a, in a lockbox that's metal or in a storage box, like a storage unit, that has metal that's closed, that you can close it and lock it. Um, you may not avoid smoke and water damage if anything is on there, but you may avoid actual fire damage. So you're trying to mitigate as much as you can. Um, we, in the last six months, I know of at least two museums, well, seven months, maybe since the, in the last year, at least two museums, one in Chicago and one in LA, um, suffered serious fires to their, uh, to, their, to their buildings and their archives and collections were in a good position for the most part because they were behind fireproof walls. We also have fireproof level doors on archives and collections. That lot good that does the guys that are not behind the fireproof wall, but this is one of the things that we're planning on working on in the next year is to get all of our archives and collections into our incredibly small spaces. We are very much outgrowing those spaces. So we're trying to, as I said last week, we want to do more boxing and organizing so that we can not only access our collections and utilize them, but we also can put them behind the fireproof vault. Um, now, if a fire were to break out in those vaults, then that's a very lovely creek we're going to be traveling up. But for the most part, the idea is preserving them the best that we can. So metal is your friend. It worked out very well for those institutions. It'll work out well for us as soon as we get down there and get to that point, and it'll work well out for you. I do know also that my parents always kept in a actually a strong box that looked like this guy. It was all metal. They've had this thing since they got married back in 1985. And all of our birth certificates, um, the deeds to the house, the cars, all the important paperwork, social security cards, all of that was in the box. And um, thanks to them putting that in the box, it survived the fire back in 1988. So I have anecdotal evidence just for you guys. Um, so if you're wanting, so papers and archives and photos, those are one thing. A lot of the biggest things that you'll probably have are old books and yearbooks. So Michigan State, this is Michigan State, 1953, The Wolverine. This is the university yearbook. Um, when it comes to old books, please be careful with the spine. Obviously, books are going to be, books should be our friends. They should be well-loved. When they come to us, you know, they're brand new. It's a whole world of possibilities. But if you're, if you're the kind of person that you want to make sure that they last long-term, especially if they're really important things you want to see last into the next generation, like a yearbook, be careful with your spines. Keep an eye out for any frame and fuzzies. Um, if you start seeing pages start to come out, again, you're gonna wanna go to a conservator or go online and find conservation methods for books. We have what is known as the, it says polyglot Bible, but it's all in English, so I'm not sure why it's called the polyglot. And as you can notice, the biggest issue you'll find is the back of the spine has Obviously, it's a very well-loved little Bible, um, has broken apart. There are methods where you could probably, because of the way this was bound, you could probably use special glue to put it back into place. But if you go to YouTube, make sure if you're going to follow someone from YouTube, and I know you guys are going to go to YouTube because everyone goes to YouTube to find this information, make sure you're finding someone who's got that information. The American Society of Conservators is also a great way to find something. If you're just looking for, you know, repair, you know, materials that they recommend, um, I think Gaylord may have some as well, but you need to be careful about it. Um, if you have, like this guy has a little clasp on here, you'll want to make sure that it's kept clean. Again, soft, um, a soft microfiber cloth will be perfectly fine. Um, keep away from heat and humidity as with everything else. And then um, if it is damaged by water, uh, if you get to it soon enough, you can, if you can, on a newer book, We'll see this one. It's a little bit more so. I have tennis elbow because of all the repair work we did a few months ago, and it's, we're keeping back up. So if you want to do it upside down to keep it open, 
so the air can flow through. You have a better chance of those pages not sticking together. If you allow it to lay flat open, like so, you run the risk of the pages that have more weight on them sticking together. Um, you can take a, I have seen this done, I don't think it's technically field appropriate, but I have seen people take um, hair dryers and very on a very low setting from a further distance, lightly dry their, their uh, to make it go a little bit faster, their books that way. That I think will be also dependent upon the type of paper that you have, but again, check with the American Society of Conservators on that one. They'll be able to help you. And then just as uh, we got about five minutes left, I've been trying to keep these about half an hour not to overwhelm you guys, um, but sometimes you're gonna find things that are fascinating in your collections. I didn't do this last week, but I'm kind of hoping to do it again this week. And I was pulling some examples this morning um, after my Google flight today. Um, I was just pulling some examples for you guys so you had something to see. And we have it, unfortunately, again, because we are <laughs> everything's just overflowing and we haven't had a chance to really go through it in the last few years. Uh, we have in one of our, on the other side of this space over here is our kitchen. And this is actually used to be a doorway. You could go between the two rooms. We're gonna try and we're gonna try and open that back up. Anyway, I was in, I was looking for something yesterday and I forgot that I had a case here that had a bunch of old books in it. And like I said, I could do a whole exhibit on Bibles because all I got, I got way, I got so many family Bibles in here. Um, and as I was pulling out books, I said, oh, this is a good book. Here's a good example of an older book that, you know, is doing pretty good. And I happen to glance at it, and you can't read it, but it says Mein Kampf. This is a copy of Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. And I was like, what? Mein Kampf? Holy cow. It's all in German. And so I, you know, I started flipping through. It's all in German. Um, there's no markings in the actual portion of the book itself. So it was probably something someone read and then just stuck up onto the shelf. But the most fascinating thing about this is, um, this says 1936. I don't really, I'm not as familiar with Mein Kampf, I'm sure someone will come into the comments and correct me. But 1936, I don't think that was the year it was published. I think it was a little bit earlier than that. But what's fascinating is in the very front of this book is a piece of paper that was attached. And we actually, this, I went into Google Translate. You know, it's not reliable, but anyway, I went in. And it turns out that this copy of Mein Kampf was given as a wedding gift to a couple by the name of Otto and Anna Barr, B-A-A-R-E. Um, Anna is a Bremer, which ironically, I have distant relatives who are Bremers. I have Germans who are Bremers, are so probably not related. But if they are, that's like, Total Twilight Zone, guys. I just found out about this whole branch of the family a few months ago doing some uh, some searching. And it was somewhere in, it was some month in 1940 that they got married. And it is actually signed by the Burgermeister, which was the mayor of the town of Bernstadt. Or Bernstadt, I'm not sure. German was the language I wanted to learn, I'm trying to learn it now. German jobs isn't helping me very much. So we often come across things in our collections that we're not really sure why we have it. Um, now what will happen is I will go through and I will try and find a, uh, a session number. If I can't find an session number, and I'm not seeing one in an initial perusal, then I may have to Google, or not Google, I have to go into Past Perfect and maybe look up Mein Kampf and see if that's come up in anywhere um, to try and figure out the history of this. Because something like this is fascinating. How does something that was given to Otto and Anna way back in 1940 in Germany by the Burgermeister with the Nazi seal of Bernstadt um, end up in our collections in Berrien Springs. So these are these mysteries that we have to solve. Sometimes even like our yearbooks, my favorite thing about the yearbooks is we'll get them, but there's no information on who the person is. <laughs> so it could be any number of these people who have given it to us. Um, a lot of information comes in when we do the donors, of course, but um, it is cool. It is exciting. Sometimes you feel a little bit like uh, a little bit like Indiana Jones. Um, but anyway, so archives, just to recap, archives are your paper artifacts. That's photos, that's paper, that's postcards, that's newspapers, that's yearbooks, that's regular books. Mein Kampf. 
Um, and when you're looking for preservation for these guys, you want to make sure that you are looking for acid-free archival quality. Peter sent a couple of links in the comments, including Conservation Resources International, also out of Virginia, another good resource. Gaylord is someone that we mentioned last week. Holling, Hollings Metal Edge is a third one. Um, but if you're just preserving general preservation within your own family, always look for acid-free archival quality. Those are your best friends. Those are your two, two phrases that are your best friends for this. Keep it in good temperature, avoid moisture, avoid heavy humidity, avoid fire, best you can, um, and even heavy heat. Always face things back to back and then front to front. And once things are face front to front, especially with photos, put something in between like a piece of tissue paper to avoid scratching of the photo or the painting um, and leaching of any sort of dyes or paints or other coloring. If you have things like scrapbooks or even regular books with no covers, lay them flat inside of an acid-free box because it'll keep everything inside. If you're gonna make repairs to grandma's scrapbook, do not, do not glue anything in there. Use, uh, do not glue anything directly back in there. Use um, the uh, scrapbook corners. Those are in good shape because they will allow for you to stick everything and then just place it in there, which but then can be brought out later on. Um, if you have uh, heavy duty items and you have, like photos or like things like that in plastic sheets, try to replace them with something different if you can. So long as it's archival quality, you should be okay in terms of like leaching of colors and damage. But please make sure that those are in proper locations because if that, if anything were to happen and moisture or heat were to get into those plastic, it will adhere to the photo or to the diploma or whatever it is and cause serious damage. If you have damaged items, please do not try to repair it yourself if you're not familiar with it. Go to a conservator, spend the money. If it's that valuable to you, the money you spend now will save you a lot of grief in the long run. If you want to do minor repair work, say to older books or whatever, go to the American Society of Conservators and uh, other organizations like that, and they can give you guidelines on how to do minor repair work in your house. Fully damaged, things like mold, and mildew can also damage your photos. We didn't talk about that, but also go there and find resources to prevent that from damaging your paper goods. The worst ones to preserve will always be your newspapers. The best ones to preserve will be your shiny things like your yearbooks. So that's it for this week. We're so glad that you joined us. Uh, next week we're gonna talk about exhibits, which I'm very excited about because we actually have the exhibit downstairs Almost done, I got two more things I got to do today. So next week, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna come live from downstairs uh, in the exhibit room. You guys will be able to see a little bit of a walk in the park. We're not gonna do too particularly much down there because I want you guys to come see when we open next month, if we open next month. Um, but we'll talk about what we do to design exhibits, what goes into it, the challenges of designing exhibits, and how an organization like ours with little money can put together a pretty big exhibit. So we got a lot going on, and then in two weeks will be our last one for April, and that will be about fundraising, development, and other ways we utilize your money to make all of this a reality. So if you have questions, don't always hesitate to comment. We'll answer here as we get those alerts during the day. Um, we are not really doing too much after hours, so we'll try and answer them when we're in the office. And again, we're so close to the 30th, so we are definitely, if we see a lot of response to these guys, and you guys really do like the digital stuff, we'll keep doing it. We, we've been having a lot of fun. There's a lot of we saying, but really it's just me. They love me. Um, we'll be happy to have you guys out. So have fun, go on and preserve and save our history. And you guys have a great rest of the week and into your weekend. Bye-bye.